Good morning, everyone. This is the adult Sunday school lesson for April 19th. Um, I'll be honest with you, when Mark mentioned conducting these uh, Sunday school lessons in this manner, I thought to myself, mid to late April, we'll be done by COVID-19 by then. Yeah, I'll do it, not thinking I would actually have to. But here I am speaking to a, a camera on a laptop uh, which is, uh, to say the least, strange, but we'll do the best we can to get through it. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Um, most of our scripture today will come from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last week we celebrated Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This week we're going to study the importance of that resurrection. Is it vital to our faith or is it just a small part of it? And uh, as we already know, it is a game changer in our faith, without a doubt. Uh, it gives us a great hope. So I'll start us off with prayer. Father, thank you for this time together, Lord. I thank you for everyone who is listening. I pray that you would bless their families. I pray that you would watch over us. I pray that you'd forgive us where we fail you. And we, again, we thank you for the great hope we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the defeat of death in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Again, Jesus Christ's resurrection from death is a game changer. Uh, God is not dead. Jesus Christ is alive and well. And uh, since he's alive and well, we have a great hope that we're going to be alive and well for eternity. Uh, imagine, if you will, for a second, the Bible without the resurrection. Uh, let's say the story of Jesus ends at the cross and at the tomb let that resonate for a moment and think about the significance of that as if that were true as we move forward. Uh, first scripture we're going to read is 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28. It says, but, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. For God has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. When everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. So, very simply, we inherited a sin nature from Adam, and the payment for that sin is death. We're all going to die an earthly death if the good Lord tarries. It's a fact. So imagine again the Bible without the resurrection. What would that mean? The death of Jesus would lose its power and significance. The cross would not mean anything. Christmas would not be celebrated. It would be meaningless. Without the resurrection, Jesus would have lost. He would be dead. And he would be a crazy liar. It would be a farce, an absurdity, a sick joke. He would be just a teacher who said some wonderful things, but also some made some very outlandish claims. He claimed he would come again and uh, be raised from the dead. Like everything else with Jesus, he leaves no room on the fence. He's either exactly who he says he is and did exactly what he said he was going to do, or he didn't. Uh, you can't make the claims that Jesus Christ did and not fulfill them without being crazy or just an evil liar. And, and of course, we know Jesus Christ was not that. Death is an amazing equalizer for all humanity. None of us can defeat it on our own. At death, what matters? Money, house, skin color, 
language, influence, health, none of that matters. All that matters is what we did with Jesus Christ. I'm going to back up a little bit and we're going to read 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. This is the scripture that's just previous to what we read earlier. It says, But it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. So without the resurrection, we found out in those verses, our faith is useless. Verse 14 verse 15 we are false witnesses about god verse 17 our faith is futile and we're still in our sins in verse 19 we are to be pitied more than all men if there was no resurrection because without the resurrection this life is all there is it's as good as it gets but we know and believe that jesus christ was resurrected so what does that mean Let's read verses 21 and 22 again. It says, for, the death, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So just as we all inherited the sin nature from Adam, from all the people that came before us, we inherit, inherit eternal life from Jesus Christ. He has the power to raise himself from the dead, and he also has the power to do the same for us. And he's made that promise. You know, if you think about it, God is a perfect combination of love and power. He has all the wonderful attributes of love. He's gentle. He's full of grace, mercy. He's just. He's truth. But with that, he also has almighty power he is omnipotent he's omnipresent he's omniscient he's almighty he's sovereign in other words if satan had god's power it would be terrible for humanity because he would have that power but he does not possess love on the other hand if god even with all of his love did not have the almighty power that he has, it would be equally detrimental to humanity. He wouldn't have the power needed to save and protect us, to give us eternal life. But thankfully he does. Again, he's the perfect mix. Very simply put, if we had an evil God, it would be a terrible situation for us, but we don't. All right, let's skip to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 58. It says, When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So what will the resurrection be like? Verse 54, what we just read says our bodies will be incorruptible. They will be immortal. I'm going to skip to 1 John 3, 1 through 2. And it says this. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. 
Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we're going to be like Jesus. I'll take that. He's the object of our worship. He's perfect. He's holy. If we're going to be like him, if he's good enough to make us like him, I'll take it. That's a pretty good deal. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 talks about the resurrection. It says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. It's hard to expound upon that. That's a pretty amazing scene if you think about it. Uh, when Jesus returns, that the dead in Christ will rise. And if we're still alive when that happens, uh, we will be pulled up in the air and meet them. Uh, I heard a joke the other day. It said this uh, woman was teaching an elementary Sunday school class. And she was trying to teach the kids how, how to get to heaven. And she said, um, she said, if I sold my house and my car and had a huge yard sale and sold everything I had and gave it all to the church, does that mean I'll go to heaven? And all the kids in the class said, no. She said, well, what if I cut the grass at the church over and over and kept everything tidy and clean? Would I go to heaven then? And they said, no. And she said, well, how do I go to heaven? And one of the little boys in the corner said, you got to be dead. <laughs> Think about that. There's a lot of truth to that. If the good Lord tarries, we got to die to get there. We have to die to get to eternity. If you think about it, we as believers and followers of Jesus Christ should view earthly death much differently than the world. In verse 54 of what we just read, it says, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death is victory for us. Verse 55, Death, where is your victory? Where is your steam? And since we view death much differently as believers in Jesus Christ, due to that, we should also view life much differently. There is no finality in death for us. It is a new birth. It is new life. It is actually a wonderful beginning for believers. We are not defeated. We are victorious in Jesus Christ when we die. Paul in Philippians 1.21 said this, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what he's saying is, hey, it's a win-win. If I continue to live, if God allows me to live, I'm going to go on doing his work. But if not, it is, it is a gain for him and for all of us as believers. Well, how, how could Paul say that? Because he was going through some pretty serious persecution. He'd been put in prison for what he was saying and preaching. So how could he say that? Well, if we're honest... Life on earth can be very difficult at times. We live in a fallen creation due to sin, so it's not perfect. Everybody has problems. Everybody goes through trials and tribulations. People have health problems. People have job and money problems. People have family problems. Death, again, from an earthly perspective, is a major problem. John 
Um, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He was telling them plainly that he was about to be arrested and crucified. And he said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. <clears throat> he didn't tell them that they might have troubles. He didn't tell them that it was possible that they could have problems. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have problems. We will have tribulation. But the great exception is, he said, take heart. I have overcome the world. <clears throat> Life on earth is like an analogy of war. God's basically saying, hey, I'm gonna, we're going to play this game of life. I'm going to put you in this war. And in this war, there are going to be many, many hard-fought battles. Everyone's going to get bruised and injured. They're going to go through pain. But due to the resurrection, he guarantees us victory at the end. We know the final score. We know that life is tough to get there at times, and, and we must go through death to get there. If the good Lord tarries. But with Christ, we win convincingly. John 20, 29, uh, when, after Jesus was resurrected, um, he appeared to his disciples. This is where Thomas, he basically says, Thomas, put your hand, put your fingers here in my hands. Put your hand here in my side. Believe. And in John 20, 29, he says this. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. We've not seen Jesus face to face, so to speak, but we believe. We know that it's true. How can we know that? Well, there, there's still some proofs. Charles Colson, uh, some of you may have read about him. He was a, uh, appointed special counsel for President Nixon. He was involved in the Great Watergate scandal. Uh, he pled guilty to obstruction of justice. Spent seven months in federal prison here in Alabama. And later came to know Christ. He became a believer and, and became an evangelical Christian. Started some great prison ministries across the country and actually in, into other countries as well. But this is his quote after he became a believer. He says, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. We can believe it. We know it's true. And we know that Christ's resurrection equates to wonderful hope for all of us as believers. And we we believe it. We cling to that. And we live because of that with great hope. So I'll close this in prayer. Father, we thank you for this uh, great hope that you've given us in the resurrection. We thank you for your wonderful power and your love and grace that you give us so freely. We pray that it will change our lives just like it changed the apostles' lives, Lord. And pray that we will live for you and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.